story ever written by one of the world's greatest storytellers, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's classic masterpiece of mystery, suspense, and horror, The Hound. Some revolting sacrificial rite has been performed. to ask me. Well, one of them is how I ever came to write the Sherlock Holmes stories. And the other is about how I came to have psychic experiences and to take so much interest in that question. a concept of the ultimate logical human being, copied by generations of writers for decades. The famous Spock of Star Trek is but one example of man overcoming his emotional frailties to emerge into the cold world of logic. But we must remember that the most popular of these cold-blooded characters is but one element from within the mind of a man who had a fascinating background, committed much of his life in search of the occult and ended his days mocked by society. Many authors throughout time have stumbled upon the world of the occult and included it within their work. One of these is the author who created the ultimate logical detective, Sherlock Holmes. Born Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle on the 22nd of May 1859, he was a prolific Scottish author and medical practitioner. He was sent to a Roman Catholic Jesuit preparatory school where he was indoctrinated into the mystical world of the Catholic religion. Following this, he went to Stonyhurst Jesuit College and by leaving school in 1875 he was declared agnostic, rejecting Christianity outright. Before moving on to university he was sent to yet another Jesuit school in Austria known as Stella Matutina, a name meaning morning star and also used for the Temple of the Golden Dawn, a secret occult society frequented by many of the great and good. This appears to have been a somewhat happier experience and he particularly enjoyed reading, stating that Edgar Allan Poe's Tales of Mystery and Imagination was a profound influence upon him. Poe was also a great influence on the James Bond author Ian Fleming, who was also schooled in Austria. Importantly, author Harold Bloom described Poe as an American Gnostic due to his mystical and metaphysical leanings.
The Jesuit connections on Doyle, however, would later in life lose in parliamentary elections for being a papist conspirator, a Jesuit emissary, and a subverter of the Protestant faith. Somebody, it seems, suspected that there was more to Conan Doyle than met the eye. Interestingly, the Jesuit order gave rise to the infamous secret society called the Illuminati, which was also founded in Austria under Adam Weizsäcker less than a hundred years before Doyle's time there and gave Fleming ideas for his evil smirch and spectre organisations. The Jesuits themselves have been called the Gestapo of the Catholic Church with their spidery web across the world infiltrating all manner of religious, commercial, political and charitable institutions, often taking on a guise that would make them unrecognisable. There is little wonder that Doyle would later predict that the forms of religion will be abandoned, but the essence will be maintained, so that one universal creed will embrace the whole civilised earth. However, from 1876 until 1881, Doyle studied medicine at Edinburgh, and upon achieving his goal, he celebrated by drawing a sketch of himself waving his diploma with the caption, Licensed to Kill. It is thought that this was indeed where Ian Fleming got the title for his later Bond book. Doyle moved on and set up a medical practice which was largely unsuccessful and began writing stories in his spare time. The most famous of these are of course the tales of the detective Sherlock Holmes and within the folds of these and other complex narratives we find elements of the occult that so fascinated Doyle. In fact the occult references are so strong that his short story collection The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes was actually banned from the Soviet Union in 1929 for their supposed occultism. The forms of the occult influence that seeped into the Doyle novels took a great many shapes. In an early work entitled The Mystery of Klumba, we find a trio of Buddhist monks having returned from the dead, seeking revenge upon an army officer. Every chapter is filled to the brim with manifestations of the paranormal. For example, astral projection, precognition, extrasensory perception and even matter transmission. This matter transmission was the concept of resolving objects into their base chemical atoms and then compelling them to take their original form. It was, in essence, a scientific language for the metaphor of alchemy, Doyle's mind making the spiritual seem logical. Some time later, Doyle wrote The Doings of Raffles Hoare, which centred around the secret of alchemy itself 
and indeed mirrors the words of the occultist Eliphas Levi in his book The Great Secret. This is the great secret. It is the secret which endows man who knows it with such a universal power as no man has ever enjoyed since the world was made. This secret, it is the dearest wish of my heart to use for good, and I swear to you, Robert McIntyre, that if I thought it would tend to anything but good, I would have it done with forever. Unfortunately, along with the mystery of Clumba, this book has been placed among what are termed Doyle's most obscure works, and next to nothing remains of the details of his lonely visit to the Coptic monastery at the Natron Lakes in Egypt, a Christian sect with distinctly Gnostic leanings. He rode 50 miles into the desert in searing heat, spending several days away from his ailing wife in Cairo. Anything I may find, strange things are to be found on the moor. Like this, for instance! The knowledge of Conan Doyle, revealed in the expanse of his works, shows that he had read widely on the subject of the occult in order to come to terms with his own inner turmoil between logic and spirit. His reference to Eliphas Levi in The Land of Mist shows quite clearly that he knew of the current surge in the world of the occult, and he even revealed this in his other works. There is also a little-known translation by Conan Doyle of a sacred alchemical text called the Nukta Miron, the origin of which is very unclear. Apollonius of Tyre, a teacher from the school of Pythagoras, is often mentioned as the author. The earliest publication in Greek is by Lorenzo de Mosheim in Amsterdam in 1721. It became better known through the translation of none other than Eliphas Levi, in his Dogma and Ritual of Magic. The English translation, however, was by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and is based on Levi's version, revealing that Doyle read Levi's work. The Nukta Mira describes in a powerful and ornate style the transfiguration of the human soul. It was intended that it penetrate deeply into the essence of the soul with every step taken, ending in the twelfth hour when the deeds of light are done. We have to remember that this was a time when many mystery movements were stirring in the world, trying to find answers to the age-old questions without having to turn to the priest. 
One of these was Theosophy, and Doyle was very closely associated with them, as was Eliphas Levi. And in fact, The Land of Mist is a theosophical work of great repute. Almost all these societies were interested in spiritualism, contacting the dead. In fact, at this period, it was not something overly mocked, with many of the great and good sharing in the supposedly new concepts. One of Doyle's own friends in the Psychical Research Society was Arthur Balfour, a future Prime Minister of England. It was, in effect, a search for truth, something Doyle said to be of the greatest importance. It was the search, in a non-religious way, for a meaning to life itself. In his very public searching, Doyle famously made friends with the American illusionist Harry Houdini, and they remained friends for many years. Houdini himself was fascinated with the world of spiritualism and the occult, collecting huge amounts of literature from Levi to the infamous occultist, Knight of Malta, alchemist, Freemason, and to some imposter, Cagliostro. Eventually, the clash of Doyle's beliefs and Houdini's logical impulse distanced them somewhat. However, on Houdini's death, Conan Doyle spoke of the sad loss of this great magician. Be his mystery what it may, Houdini was one of the most remarkable men of whom we have any record, and he would live in history with such personalities as Cagliostro, the Chevalier de Urn, and other strange characters. It is strange enough that Houdini be compared with Cagliostro, but stranger still that he be compared with the Chevalier Dion, who was a spy, a Freemason, and was even suspected of being female. What Doyle saw in his Freemasonic brother, Houdini, was a depth of knowledge and a will to find the truth. A modern alchemist. However, these great ideals and intentions can, and have often, led well-meaning people up the garden path to where the fairies reside. My heart was gladdened when out here in far Australia I had your note and the three wonderful pictures which are confirmatory of our published results. When our fairies are admitted, other psychic phenomena will find a more ready acceptance. We have had continued messages at seances for some time that a visible sign was coming through.
Richard Doyle, from the very start, had loved the world of folklore. He spent his time in the world of the imagination, with elves, goblins, fairies and sprites. One particular journal entry explains to our modern, psychologically inclined minds exactly what was occurring. He claimed openly that when he was young, he was kept awake by strange visions as he lay in bed. He was visited by gnomes and fairies, and try as he might, he could not stay awake long enough to draw them. This world that Doyle's uncle speaks of is the world of the mystic. It is the world that lies at the point between awake and asleep. It is the dark world of the mind, bringing forth images from the unconscious world into our very consciousness. Whatever is placed within the folds of the dark fabric of the unconscious world is from everyday experience and indeed from possible quantum connection to the universe itself. These images and thoughts, sights and sounds, often find a way of expressing themselves to our conscious mind. These gateways into our world are dreams, or lucid dreaming, where we are neither awake nor asleep. We need not imagine that Conan Doyle was toying with these concepts because he wrote about them, specifically in The Leather Funnel. In this interesting esoteric tale, Doyle has his character sleep with a peculiar leather funnel artifact so that he may understand its true origin from within his sleeping state. The hero does indeed enter a world of darkness, which he describes as hell, but nevertheless retrieves the information desired. It is the journey of the shaman, spoken of thousands of times, it is a journey into another world. This world is the one that the mystics have utilised for thousands of years to supposedly connect with the divine. It is the sleepless state that angels, demons, aliens and even ghosts are seen. The world of the mystic is beautiful and yet hellish, for what we find is what we are. Often. These experiences are extreme and can cause mental disturbances. Sometimes these mental disturbances were brought on purposefully, such as in the case of Sherlock Holmes, who abuses cocaine, and some biographers assert that Doyle himself may have taken the drug to see better into the other world. In Doyle's day, although taking cocaine was legal and widespread, the effects often caused severe mental breakdown that was classed as madness and lunacy. Unless you overcame the problem, then you would find yourself in an insane asylum. This is precisely what happened to that other great artist, Charles Doyle, Conan Doyle's father. In one of his sketchbooks, he wrote, Keep steadily in view that this book is ascribed wholly to the produce of a madman. My mind is going. There is no question about it. But it 
music was both Charles Doyle's artistic influence and Uncle Richard's that would play upon the mind of young Arthur. The very speed with which Arthur Conan Doyle could write stories and the creativity and fluidity of his work could now easily be put down to his inner connection to his own unconscious self. He was an open gateway, just like his father and uncle, and experienced mystical, occult impulses that are evidenced by his lifelong search for the truth. Arthur Conan Doyle was drawn to the world of the esoteric and Gnostic thought because he experienced thoughts and visions just like the members of his own family. This, in turn, leads one to wonder on the genetic link, which has been proven by modern science to be real, that Conan Doyle was mystically inclined due to his own heritage. The Theosophical Society, founded by such mystics and some would say fraudsters as Madame Blavatsky, was deeply interested in the esoteric and Gnostic world. It is even claimed that Blavatsky herself aided Conan Doyle and that he sought her mediumship skills. There is little wonder that later on in his life he was drawn by his friends into the Theosophy Society, to the infamous Cottingley Fairies and the tale of how two little girls took a few photographs and fooled the genius creator of Sherlock Holmes. What was the man's name? Uh, uh, well, he's uh, 50 ish, sandy haired, medium build. He said all you observed, uh, no characteristics. Well, I really hoped when I had the chance of examining on the bed, the most obvious characteristic was well, he was dead. Just who did Conan Doyle base his most infamous of characters upon? Was there a detective sleuth at large that formed the basis of this most famous of fictional characters? Or did he simply spring from the mind of the creator? The truth is to be found on many levels. Most people who know anything about Conan Doyle will know that his teacher at Edinburgh University Joseph Bell bore a striking physical resemblance to the later creation, quite apart from the fact that he taught the art of deduction. Even Sir Arthur himself made this assertion, and so we have one side of Sherlock in this university lecturer. But what about the solid, anti-spiritualist aspect revealed by Doyle? Well, there was a man whom Conan Doyle would meet later in life, and who he had admired for many years. He had spoken out against spiritualism, calling it a plague, and saying that spiritualism is quietly undermining the traditional ideas of the future state. His name was Oliver Wendell Holmes. Like Conan Doyle, Wendell Holmes was a physician, and he was the pinnacle of the logical element that Doyle admired. Stating, I saw, as a medical man, how a spicule of bone or a tumour pressing on the brain would cause what seemed an alteration of the soul. This revealed his own inner sense of conflict. On the one hand, he had been brought up in a family that sensed more, with a mother who read him tales of legend and myth, an uncle who saw fairies and painted them, and a father who resided in an insane asylum till the end of his days because of his inability to deal with his own visions. And yet, his medical training and the influence of Joseph Bell and Wendell Holmes forced home the facts and figures, the science and the scrutiny. <music> the 
This turmoil had to be worked out, and like most writers, Conan Doyle did so on paper. Sherlock Holmes became a mixture of the mind of Doyle himself, with all his life's influences. He struggled with his own inner feelings and almost mystical experiences, and yet balanced them sufficiently to create fictional works of pure genius. Sherlock fought the foolish notions of spiritualism, and yet Dr. Watson questioned, was God-fearing and open. Their constant dialogue reveals the inner voice of Conan Doyle himself, the dark and light at war. In Doyle's case, he fought the battle for many years and finally succumbed in the end to a little of both. But there was another character introduced by Doyle which revealed his own darker emotions, Professor Moriarty. Anybody who knows of this infamous character will know that he is an evil genius with almost the exact opposite mind and role as Sherlock Holmes. He is the Gnostic darkness sent to test the light, to reunite. In fact, Moriarty's Christian name is James and the Gnostic belief was that James was not just the brother of Jesus, the light, but also the twin. Fair hair or golden locks were a physical symbol of the one who was the light, and of course, Sherlock simply means bright-haired. It is fitting in this respect that Sherlock himself should die supposedly entwined with Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls, only to be resurrected alchemically like the phoenix of legend. Moriarty bears too many close resemblances to Conan Doyle, if in a sense a kind of wraith-like spectre of himself. He is born in Ireland, from where the Doyle family originated, and has many of Doyle's self-beliefs. In the words of Doyle himself, he is a genius, a philosopher, an abstract thinker. According to Inspector MacDonald of Scotland Yard, in the Valley of Fear, Moriarty was like a father figure, very talented, and they spoke about eclipses. This was a subtle clue laid down by Doyle, as the eclipse is when the light and dark come together. But, said Doyle, Moriarty had dark tendencies, hereditary and diabolical tendencies. A criminal strain ran in his blood. This darkness within Conan Doyle is the turmoil, the chaos of the conflict between logic and spirit, conscious and unconscious, and is revealed in his own words. I had everything in those few years to make a man contented, and yet my soul was often troubled within me. I felt that I was born for something else, and yet I was not clear what that something else might be. My mind felt out continually into the various religions of the world. I could no more get into the old ones as commonly received than a man could get into a boy's suit. This statement speaks of a turning point in Doyle's life a time when he resurrects Holmes, and a time when he steps more boldly into the world of the spirit. He begins to agree more wholeheartedly with the future Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, when he said in paraphrasing Shakespeare, there are things in heaven and earth not hitherto dreamed of in our scientific philosophy. It seems also in the words placed into the mouth of Sherlock Holmes that Doyle was revealing a little of himself. My mind rebels against stagnation. Give me problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I am in my own proper atmosphere. 
but I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave for mental exaltation. Conan Doyle worked out the Gnostic and even Jesuit influences that he had been party to on the pages of his novels. In The Hound of the Baskervilles there is a satanic force and Grimpen Mire, where the tale is set, is in fact derived from Anglo-Saxon for the devil. This is the return of Sherlock, written years after Doyle had killed him off. Here he enters the dark hellish world and struggles against the dark nature. Doyle would in the end find his mental exultation in the realm of the spirits and the unknown. What Doyle was searching for, found and relayed to us in the many tales he told is ancient wisdom. It is knowledge of the mind of man from within the mind of man, worked out for generations and placed in the sacred texts and symbols of the world by all manner of cultures. Doyle believed he was guided by one of the ancients, by the name of Phineas, whom his second wife communicated with. Phineas was an Arab scribe from Ur in ancient Sumeria, a concept much alive within the theosophical movement at the time, and still very much to this day. However, all these cultures have come to the same conclusions about ourselves. Not because they all emerge from some sunken Atlantis or ancient astronaut, but because our minds all work on the same principles. Doyle, as a member of the Freemasons, Psychical Research Society, and in all likelihood a regular visitor of the Theosophical Society, would have gathered these facts, for they are taught within most mystery schools. The truths lead us not into science nor spirit, but to nature and intuition, to a place within the self that is open and free to allow our natural self to speak out. By working through these ancient processes, Doyle was attempting to overcome what he himself had become, confused. The process clears confusion, balances out the fire and water of our natures and allows the creative spark to ignite a pure flame. Often, those who have experienced the very real and human mystical moment of lucid dreaming are left with a sense of needing to know more. Add to this a family of creative people, the myth and fantasy stories of the mother and the mysticism of the Catholic and Jesuit world, and we are left with deep desires. Desires to find answers to the many conflicts that arise in the mind of a man who is being taught science and the art of deduction. Logical deduction, scientific analysis and detective genius ran alongside myth, mystery and mysticism for Conan Doyle and he needed to square this circle. He did so in the end by becoming a religious fanatic for spiritualism and lost many friends in so doing, but he was at least settled in his new belief. The end result was a lifetime of literary works, some bizarre and some beautiful, some crazy and some creative, but always signposts along the way for a man who was walking a path of discovery. Today, 
we can look back at these signs and see moments from the mind of Doyle and how he struggled with his own emotions and thoughts. We can see how he merged the mythological world with the cold world of reality. And in that fusion, he created an eternal story that speaks to us all. Because it is a caricature of our lives, regardless of the period in which we live. The subtle and friendly battles between Holmes and Watson are but the balance of perfection within our minds that must be found if we are to solve the riddles of existence. Thank you.